Praise God. Welcome all of you to this beautiful Sunday morning service. So, thank you for joining us today. I also welcome everyone who is going to view us and join us online. Let's begin today's service with a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you Lord for each person that's gathered in your name and in your presence, Father God. Father God, we just commit the entire service into your loving hands, Father God. We know, Lord Jesus, that there's something special that each of us will receive today, Lord. Something special that you want to speak to us about, Lord. Something that you want to do in our lives. Father God, we just believe that your son Jesus will show up today, Lord. He'll be glorified in our midst, Lord. He'll be magnified in our midst, Father God. We commit the worship team into your hands, Lord. That you'll anoint both the brothers, Lord. And they'll be able to glorify you powerfully, Lord Jesus. We also pray for everyone seated here. That you'll bless them abundantly, Lord. You'll speak to them clearly, Lord. And you'll strengthen them in the inner man, Lord. We commit the entire service from the beginning to the end into your hands, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I request Brother Prashant and Brother Thiru to come and Thank you. 
before him they were on the ground their faces were on the ground because we serve a God who is mightier than our mind can imagine he is such a mighty powerful great and awesome and no words to express how good and how great God is oh Lord we bow before you at this time we give our life to you once again we want to give this time, this hour, this moment in worshipping, in praising you. We want to just tell you that thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. Hallelujah. You're the way maker. You're the one who can make a way in the wilderness. You can even provide water in the desert. Hallelujah. We know how powerful you are. Lord, bless your name this time. Hallelujah. Oh God, make a way where there seems to be no way. It works in ways we cannot see. You will make a way for me. 
seems to be no way. Our mind cannot understand how oh, oh, God you work in our lives. But we know Lord that you can make a way. Hallelujah. There is none like you, Father. Hallelujah. There was there is no one else like you. Hallelujah. There is no like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I can search for all eternity long. If I find there is no life, let's see it again. There is no like you. Eternity long, and find there is no 
Search for all eternity long and find there is no, yes, there is no, there's none like you, Lord. There is no like you with lifted hands. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I could search for all eternity long and find there is like you. I could search for all eternity long and find there is no, there is no. Like you. Loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. For worship. For we know that there is no one else like you. On the face of the earth, we couldn't find you. Your mercy flows like a river. Why? Oh, Jesus, thank you, Lord. For every day in our lives, your mercy is on you. And we acknowledge your presence in this place. We thank you for this beautiful church, beautiful people, online and offline, enjoying the worship, enjoying the word of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for this time. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the life that you have given us to worship you, to bless you in this fashion. Oh, we want to give you praise this time. You are so great and awesome and powerful and wonderful. We commit the rest of the service. For that, we commit all the people into your hands, into your loving hands. Whatever problem that they're going through, whatever the challenges they're going through, facing challenges in this world, might be any challenges. Before you, it is very small. Because we know you are greater than the problem that we go through. You can make it move. Oh Lord, thank you, Jesus. Right now you're moving on the problems. Oh, we thank you for the peace. Oh, we thank you for the joy in the family. Oh, we thank you for the understanding in the family. Hallelujah, Lord. That you would bless every family that is watching online who are with us. That you would give peace, joy, as a of understanding. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. Rest of the service as we hear the word of God. Lord, I pray that you tune our ears to hear the word of God. We want you to bless every word that comes out of your mouth, your servant. Let it be a blessing for all of us. Oh Jesus, you speak to our hearts. Teach us the way we should walk. Let the Spirit of God move. Let the Spirit of God speak. Because the Bible says, I am the Spirit. Worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And we wait upon you in the same spirit to receive from you. Speak to our hearts. Be with us. Guide us, lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, brothers, for leading us in such a blessed time of worship. God bless you all abundantly. Once again, welcome each of you to our Sunday morning service. Let's begin the service by reading a scripture portion taken from Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 verses 18 to, uh, sorry, verses 15 to 21. I'll just read for you. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all yet he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying behold my servant whom I have chosen my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased I 
put my spirit upon him and he will desire he will declare justice to the gentiles he will not quarrel nor cry out nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets a bruised reed he will not break a smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory and his name gentiles will trust praise god let's so today is a very very important chapter that each of us need to study and i believe that even as we were singing and praising that god is giving so much direction to the church and i strongly so much of confirmation was there that god wants us to focus on his love and loving others and i believe this year and the year 2024 we have to walk in love you know why because the bible says at one point in heaven gifts are going to cease prophecies are going to cease but what is going to carry on in heaven only love the bible says love endures forever and jesus love is not god but god is love so love is very very important to the lord jesus if it's important to him it should be important to us so as a church my prayer is that we start walking in love being kind gentle manifesting the fruits of kindness and goodness how will the world know you and me as believers they will know us by one thing the bible says they will know each of us by our love for one another not going to the gifts all that will be there but by our love and kindness for one another that's how the world should recognize and know us so coming back to the scripture portion for today so today matthew chapter 12 verse 15 to 21 a beautiful prophecy that matthew he quotes a prophecy from the book of isaiah and what is this prophecy who is giving this prophecy to isaiah it's very clearly when you read the prophecy that matthew is quoting from isaiah it is the father giving a prophecy about his son the lord jesus christ a very powerful prophecy he says behold this is my servant in whom i am well pleased a beautiful prophecy a powerful prophecy that each of us should study and when matthew is writing it he is seeing this prophecy being fulfilled before his eyes and today you and i are walking in this prophecy we have seen what the lord jesus has done the first part of verse 18 says behold my servant whom i have chosen and when i was studying this verse look at just take a servant for example take someone who serves you maybe it's a cook in your house or somebody who keeps your house clean or somebody who comes and serves you food if anyone needed to be served it was the lord jesus christ so each of us know what it is to be served when we go to a restaurant the waiter will come ask us how we are what kind of food and we know how to receive but jesus was the only person who needed to be served but yet the father is telling my servant whom i have chosen what does that mean when you look at the life of jesus 24 hours before his crucifixion what happened of course after some time he went to the garden of gethsemane he shed a lot of blood but 24 hours before his crucifixion what did jesus do if any of us knew we're going to die what would we do we'll prepare so many things we'll be worried about so many things we'll get things in contact our possession our property etc but jesus he knelt down on the floor and he washed the disciples feet one of the disciples said no lord but when jesus explained to him why he said wash my whole body not only my feet wash my whole body so jesus taught the disciples a great life lesson in what it is to be humble all of us like to be served but we have to learn from the lord jesus jesus said that that if you want to be great in the kingdom you must first be a servant not of one person or two person you must be a servant of all so if you want to be great in the kingdom of god you and i must start changing our mindset and start serving people jesus did exactly that and this was a prophecy by the father about the son as we continue my beloved son in whom my soul is well pleased 
what does this verse mean? My beloved son, in whom my soul is well pleased. One thing that you realize when you look at the father and the son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So you just see how much love the father had for his son. In these words, we see the son and there is something about the trinity. The trinity is three, one God, but three persons, but there is one God and in the beginning itself, we see how the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son are working together. They say, let us make man in our image and our likeness. So now we see the heart of the Father for the Son. What deep love and compassion the Father has. He says, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. So love didn't exist just from God to us. It existed among the Godhead. It existed among the Trinity from the beginning. There was love between the Father and the Son and you see so much of synchrony and unity in how they work. As we continue to read, Paul had a revelation of this love. Romans 8 verse 38 to 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Today first we understood how much of love there is between the Father and the Son. Now Paul is getting a revelation of that love, of love that is being given to mankind being extended to you and me. Many a time we may worry, what if we are not spiritually on fire for God? What if some challenges come? What if this challenge doesn't go? What will happen in the future? Will we spiritually backslide? Many I know have that fear of losing their salvation. Many have that low because they are not living right. They are not doing. They have that fear of losing salvation. So Paul he is writing to the Romans. He had a revelation of the love that is there extended to you and me. And this verse is so beautiful. It says, even when you, even in death, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Even when you are living today, nothing can come in between the love that Jesus has for you and me. It's saying, not only angels, angels are very powerful beings. They control many demons at times. There are powers, principality. Not only these little demons that trouble people, but even those powers and principalities, they cannot come between the love of the Father and the Son for you and me. So you and I, we have a love from Jesus that is very, very secure. So a believer should not have any fear at all. It says, not things in the present, not the things that you see today, not the problems in the present or these principalities that are afflicting you, troubling you. They cannot separate you from the love of God. Now, in the future, if any big situation comes, any big problem, any big challenge, even at that time, you don't have to worry. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. It says, no height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So today, we must have that assurance. As we go on in life, the challenges will only get higher and high. We can't expect challenges to just go. We are in a fallen world. If any of you know how to swim, you will know for those of you who swim well, when you are swimming in a river, as the river flows, if you swim along, it's very easy. But our life is not like swimming in the river. Have you ever swam in a beach? I've gone. I've not tried to swim because I know it's the minute you try to swim, the waves will push you back. Keep pushing. So how difficult? Only the best swimmers can swim against the tide and go inside. So, today you and I are not like swimming in the river. We are swimming against the tide. So, everything is against the believer. People are against the believer. Challenges will be against the believer. Most importantly, Satan and his principalities don't want the believer to progress. But here, we realize that nothing can separate us from the love of God. No matter what we do, we have to keep progressing and God's love will not leave us. Secondly, Paul 
again writes to the Ephesian church. And when you read Ephesians 3.17.9, you must understand when is Paul writing to the Ephesian church? Is he writing when he's preaching where crowds are following? No, he's writing this letter to the Ephesian church. He's writing it when he was in prison. And in those days, the prison is not like our prisons that you see today. It's, it used to be down, sometimes underground, in a dungeon full of soil and dirt. And it seems the prisons in those days, you can't even breathe properly. There will just be a small light. They will give the prisoner something that they want, that they ask for. But at that time, Paul is writing this great revelation. And he is writing to the Ephesian church. Let me just read this to you. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> there is a height and a length. That's why God's love is so vast. You and I must recognize. And one thing, you are not going to understand God's love by just thinking about it. You are not going to understand God's love by trying to feel it. No. It says if you want to understand God's love, it has to go past your thoughts, your emotions, go past all of that. But how does that happen? It's It won't just happen automatically. Like I said, we are swimming against the tide. You have to put in an effort. The Bible says in the last verse, if you want to live, the, it says that you may be filled with the fullness of God. How will you be filled with the fullness of God? How will you li live the Christian life to its fullest? And this is the secret that Paul gives the Ephesian church. He says, you must by revelation, that passes the revelation that crosses all your thoughts, your imaginations, a revelation that can only come from the Holy Spirit, and that comes when you take time in God's presence every day. All of us, when we come to pray, we put out our petitions, our prayer requests. If you think about it, the first thing that we do is we pray for our request, our family, our future, our ministry, our jobs. But seldom do we focus on what Paul prayed. He prayed this over the efficient church that God opens their eyes of understanding to see how much God loves each of us and my brother and sister, I encourage you, even in the weeks to come, when you pray, ask God, God, give me a revelation of how deeply you love me. Give me a revelation of what Paul is talking about. My friends, when you do that and get an understanding, no matter what challenge you see in life, let anyone reject you. Let it be your own children, your parents, your husband, your wife. Even if they reject you, it's not going to bother you if... Like what Paul says, you are rooted and grounded. You just know beyond a doubt, God loves me though I am not perfect. He loves me deeply. He loves me unendingly. So much He loves me. When you understand that, what's going to happen? You are going to then begin to start living in the fullness of God. So what is the secret? Not going evangelizing, not going doing this, that. No, the secret is in your quiet time. Receive that revelation of God's love. Receive that love for you. And you are going to walk in the fullness of God's glory, in the fullness of God's strength. Nothing is going to shake you. Nothing is going to, no matter what you see, you stand strong and you'll keep progressing and going forward. Let's just finish the prophecy from Isaiah that Matthew is quoting and we'll close. Then the father is saying, I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice. What is this justice? I was reading the interpretation of this justice. And firstly, the commentaries say that God does not take sin lightly. It's not that God just says, okay, this boy sinned. Okay, let's forgive him and let no, no, no. God is a very, very holy God. God hates sin. God cannot tolerate sin. He has put in a system where sin has to be punished. There should be some judgment for sin. There should be a punishment for sin. Or there should be a sacrifice 
for that sin that a person has committed. In the Levitical system, there is so many rituals for a simple sin that they would commit. They have to wash, cleanse themselves. They had to go out in the evening. They had to enter the temple. They had to offer sacrifices. So many rules and regulations that were there. So sin was never taken lightly by God. So we may think, okay, sin is okay. No, no, God is never okay with sin. So God had to bring judgment for sin. So what does he mean when he's saying he will declare justice to the Gentiles? That means we may think, okay, God is saying, you Gentiles, you're going to be judged. You have to pay for your sin. You're going to see the consequences of your sin. I'm just, justice is going to come upon you. No, the justice is that for all the sin of the Gentiles and for the sin of the entire world, Jesus has already paid the price in full. So when he's saying, I'm declaring justice, he's saying, Gentiles, you have been justified. You have been sanctified. The price for your sins Sin is wrong. I hate sin. But the price for your sin has been paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what declaring justice means. He's saying, now Gentiles, you're set free if you put your trust on the Lord Jesus. You're set free. Your sins are forgiven. So look at this prophecy. The father in Isaiah 700 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the father makes Isaiah write this about the son. And that is what you and me see. Jesus fulfilled all of this. He declared justice to the Gentiles. Just two more verses and we'll wind up. Verse 19, He will not quarrel nor cry, nor will anyone hear his voice in the street. The beginning of the chapter itself says that when Jesus was persecuted in one place, he would move to another place. He didn't take time to stop justify himself. The Jews kept on saying so many false things about him. They even said that he was from Beelzebub, blasphemy. They even did that to Jesus. But Jesus did not stop and argue with them. He just moved from one place to another. Some say that Jesus went into hiding. No, it says when Jesus left one place and departed another, multitudes followed him. So he didn't go into hiding. He just did not quarrel. He did not get into wasteful arguments. He just went to another place. So that's what it should be for you and me. When people falsely accuse us, don't get off the track. If you are running on a race course and the crowd is telling something at you or telling you are not running properly, if you take time to listen to them, you are going to become slow in the race. You are going to lose or you are going to become second, third or fourth instead of coming first. So don't take time and start thinking about what others told you. If they are saying bad things, let them say. You continue to keep your eyes on Jesus and just keep doing what Jesus has told you to do today. What he has told you today, as you continue to do that faithfully, he will come and he will tell you what to do next. So Jesus never spent time to quarrel, nothing like that. He just left one place, went to another place. So move on. Don't bother about the accusations. Finally, he says, this is a beautiful verse. He says, a bruised reed he will not break and smoking flax he will not quench till he sends justice to victory. So finally, he is saying that if you have seen a plant that has a small cut on it or a bruised, these weeds that you see in the lake sometimes, near the lake you will see these weeds, sometimes they will be a little broken. They will be a little broken. That means if anyone just taps them, they will break and they will die. So they are in such a situation. So it is saying here, Jesus is saying, the father is talking about Jesus, that anyone who is broken hearted, anyone who is going through difficulty, anyone who is going through personal challenges, anyone who is going through condemnation, rebuke from their families or any other challenge or sick or weary, depressed, that kind of person, Jesus will not break. He'll see, he won't come and condemn you. You've done all these things wrong maybe. He's not going to come and condemn you and beat you for those things. But in fact, he will strengthen you. He'll heal that wound and he'll help you to come back and come back and stay strong. And a flax, he will not quench that matchstick. When it's just when you burn it and it goes out and light fire, you'll see. Saying, 
Jesus will not like pour water or pour something to quench that. So when you are going through a problem, at that particular time, Jesus will come and help you out of that problem. He will strengthen you and bring you back. And finally it says, the final part of this prophecy, verse 21 says, And his name, and in his name, Gentiles will trust. And what does this mean in his name? Gentiles will trust. It means nothing but the Israelites, any nation that is outside Israel were referred to as the Gentiles. So the father is prophesying about the son saying that now in the name of Jesus, the Gentiles are going to put their trust not only for salvation but also for deliverance, for healing. For everything that they need. So the last part of this prophecy from Isaiah says, the Gentiles are going to begin to trust in the name. That's you and me seated here. We are the Gentiles and one part of the prophecy, this last part is being fulfilled, has been fulfilled. You and I have trusted in the name of the Lord Jesus and that's why we are saved and we are delivered, we are set free, we are healed. Last verse that I want to read for you and then we'll close. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. What is this verse saying? This verse is saying nothing but let there be a special place in your heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. Always, in everything that you do, let there be a special place. Set a place apart in your heart that we know that we are living for the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is holy. We have to be holy. We have to give him every preference. First place, set him apart. And now, the last part of what Peter is trying to tell us, he's saying, when people look at us now, they know that we have a hope because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They know that we have some security that the world may not have. The world will look at everything natural when they go through a crisis. But when somebody looks at you and they see brother or sister, they are still strong during the problem. They have not crumbled during the problem. They are still standing strong. And when they come and ask you, how come? You are like this. How come you not anyone else would have just broken? Anyone else would have been defeated, destroyed? How come you are like that? And at that time when people see your lives, when they see your hope, when they see your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will come and ask you. There will be opportunities like that. And when they ask you, what are you supposed to do? It says, to everyone who asks you a reason for this hope that you have, that that is in you with meekness and fear you are supposed to tell them that it's because of the Lord Jesus Christ and like I said at the beginning they will know each of us by our love for one another they will know that we have hope in our heart we are not desolate like the world we have someone we have the Lord Jesus to strengthen us during that problem so I pray that God will give opportunities to each of you that people will look at your lives and they'll come and ask you, what is your hope, Minley? What is your hope, Agastya? What is your hope, Rupesh? And then you tell them that it's because of the Lord Jesus Christ. You witness to them. Let them see your love for one another and witness to them. Just quickly summarizing what we studied today, then we'll pray. Matthew chapter 12, verse 15 to 21. We understood how great was the Father's love for the Son. How great and beautiful was the father's love for the son, the beautiful unity between the Trinity. Then we also know today you and I have a very powerful and a perfect love that God has given to us. But don't forget, you will not automatically are not going to understand how deeply God loves you, how great is his love. You have to take time in prayer. And my friends, the problems that you are worried about today when you understand how much God loves you, you will just know that you don't even have to worry about it. God is already taking care of those problems. God already is having a plan to deliver you from those problems. So, if you want to live in the fullness of God, remember, 
get a revelation of God's love in prayer this week. Take a little time. Ask God to open your eyes to understand how much He loves you. That's all you need to begin with and God will move on. Then, when you understand that great love for you, when you have a great hope in your heart that Jesus is there with you, He loves you deeply, when others come and ask you, tell them about the love that God has for you in kindness, in gentleness and meekness. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Let's just quickly pray for the tithe and the offering and then we'll close. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word today, Lord. We also remember the tithe and the offering right now, Lord. For those who have already given online, for those who have given here today physically, Lord, for others who have contributed, Lord, for the outreach and for the extension of your kingdom, Lord. We just thank you for each hand that is given, Lord. We bless the hands that have sowed into your ministry, Lord. Lord, may they really see a bountiful harvest. May they be blessed abundantly, Father God. And may they have all sufficient for themselves, their families, and for every good work, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Father God, once again, thank you for your word that has come, Lord. Thank you for the direction you are giving us as a church, Father God. Thank you, Lord. What a beautiful love that you had, Father, for the Son, the Son for you, and the, the unity among the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Father God. We thank you for the love that you have for each of us today, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that each person seated here, each person watching online, you know, their prayer request, Lord. You know the things that they are trusting you for, Lord. You know those sicknesses, those diseases or anything that is troubling or worrying them. Father God, even now, may they just know that you are going to take care of it completely, Father God. That you have the power to change the situation overnight, Lord. You can change the situation, Lord. In a second, Lord. At the minute Daniel prayed, you answered, Father God. May everyone have an assurance that their prayers are answered, Father God. In Jesus' name, Father God, let them just see a mighty deliverance even today, Lord. In Jesus' name, Father God. Father God, lastly we pray, Lord, strengthen us. When people see us and they look at the hope that we have, when they look at the love that we have for each other, and they ask us about you, Lord. Help us to beautifully, in meekness, in gentleness, in kindness, tell them about you, Lord. Your saving grace, your power to forgive, Lord. Your hand of healing, Lord. Your hand of deliverance, Lord. Your hand of comfort and compassion. Father God, we thank you once again, Lord. Once again, we just bless every member seated here. We bless every member watching online, Lord. May they be blessed and transformed by your word today, Lord. May your presence just rest upon them today, Lord. May your anointing be doubled upon them, Lord. May their anointing be multiplied, Father God. Wherever they are working, whatever they are doing, Lord, you bless the work of their hands. In Jesus' name, Father God, like Joseph, Give them favor, Lord. Give them wisdom, Lord. Give them anointing in the areas that you place them in today, Father God. And in everything, we give you all the glory, Master. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of us, both now and and forevermore, in Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. God bless you. Have a very blessed week. And also everyone viewing us online, God bless you. Thank you.